Hi everyone and welcome back to the Commodore Room. Hope everyone's having a great day. Today is the next game in our series of game reviews and the game we're going to be looking at is Kennedy Approach. Kennedy Approach is a game where you're an air traffic controller. Your job is to get planes from one point to the next without any incidents such as crashes, emergency landings, or, or things of that nature. I know that sounds fairly simple, but actually it turns out it makes a really good game. As you can see, it's a nice bright green box, which was something that Micro Pros did uh, back in the 80s. As you can see, there's a little illustration on the front with you know cool airplanes and emergency vehicles and, and whatnot to make you excited about playing the game. And a lot of times they did this, well actually all the times they did this, because the graphics in the games weren't, weren't like they are today. Today you can just show screenshots of a game and then you'll get an idea of what it's about but back in the 80s that wasn't quite the case uh, really uh, really exemplified by the Atari 2600 if you've ever seen their boxes and how they do things so uh, something here really cool graphic picture on the front on the back a little bit about the game and of course a little advertisements for some of their other games which some of these were pretty good and then finally what you see here is a little uh, inset of a screenshot of the game the nice thing about this, this is actually representative of what you'll see on the Commodore 64. This is not taken from one platform and, and brought over to another, and that was a trick that some of the publishers would use back in the day. They would show uh, like an IBM EGA version of a game on a Commodore, which uh, had better color and graphics, um, or they would show something from a Commodore for an, an Apple II or something like that. Anyway, um, looks pretty good on the outside. It's certainly interesting, so let's open it up. So on the inside here, we're going to see some of our, our standard items. We've got the warranty card, which we're probably not going to read, but we've got that. We've got a catalog of other MicroProse games. Probably not going to read that. Uh, we have the disc itself. Unfortunately, this disc is pretty old, as you can imagine, and the label has fallen off. But I keep it in here just so we can see what it would it look like. I don't know that the sleeve is original. I know MicroProse did have some different sleeves in some of their games, so I'm not going to judge the sleeve. We'll look at the game, uh, the disc itself. So it does look professional. It's got a professionally made label. Uh, looks pretty nice. Uh, MicroProse always had their, their company name in big letters on their discs, uh, at least in many cases, and so that's good. And the green, of course, matches the green of the box, so the disc looks nice. And then here's the book itself. Again, we see that same illustration. Uh, it's a nicely done, it's a very glossy book, so it's it's nice and professional feeling and looking. And to give you an idea, it's around 22 pages, so it's, you know, it's a decent sized book. Uh, certainly not uncommon for that era. And as you're flipping through this, what you're going to see is, is some you know, basic instructions on how to play the game and some other technical information. One thing you're going to see in here and this is very common on games from the era, was this little box here. The idea behind this little box here is this is essentially copy protection. If you made a copy of this disc, which may or may not have had some technical um, limitations to uh, dis uh, discourage copiers, you had to have the manual. So it's going to ask you some things while you're playing the game or while you boot up the game that can only be found in this box in the manual. Now typically hackers or crackers of the day could just remove that code from the game and, and that would be easy. Um, and, and at some point we'll do a video on that, but there was uh, disks or copy programs that have what were called parameters. And parameters were basically little uh, changes to the program code to disable things like this. Um, some of these were pretty well done in the programs and some of them were really easy to turn off, just depended. So you're going to see a lot of this and you'll see these little boxes appear throughout the manual. But the game is pretty straightforward. As you can see, the, the manual goes into some good detail, gives you everything that you need to know in order to play the game. And then, as was also somewhat common, and this was pretty common on uh, a lot of the games in the era, was just a lot of background in information that wasn't really necessary to play the game. So here it's giving you a lot of terms commonly used in air traffic control, um, symbols for some of the maps, and you'll see here that the uh, airports in the game, these are maps of the airports with some of the, the signals that, uh, symbols, that air traffic controllers might see on a real map. So there's a lot of background information here um, that could really get you interested in the content uh, and it was actual real content that in, the, in a lot of cases was just not even in the game. So not it's a lot common, more common now to see these types of things in games but back in the uh, back in the 80s they couldn't put it in the game for technical reasons, uh, limitations on memory and storage and whatnot and they would just put it in the manual. 
So that's Kennedy Approach. Let's fire this game up. Okay, let's get this game going. You'll see here that I'm actually loading the game from a back bit cartridge. So I've got a disk image on there, and I'm going to use that instead. Um, the reason is because the disk, as you saw, was pretty old and has been through a lot and actually no longer works. It works a little bit, but then it, it hangs up and can't read anything. So we're going to play it off of this. Um, I have played it off original media before. The load times are not horrible. Um, once the game's going, it actually is pretty quick. So there's not much in the way of load times, but you're not going to see that here. You will see a pretty cool intro screen. Uh, pretty common to have a really neat intro screen, again, to get you excited about playing the game, even though those graphics aren't going to be representative of the gameplay itself. The next thing that you're going to see here is where I pick the level and the city. So we're going to go ahead and just start in Atlanta at level 1, just to give you an idea of what's going on. At the top row, you'll see ID, where you can use the letter on the keyboard to um, highlight or talk to that plane, or you can use the joystick and, and go over and push the button. The origin is the letter, the first letter of the origin, where the flight is coming from, and the destination, of course, is where the plane's going. Some will take off or land at your airport in Atlanta that you'll see here. Other ones are just going to cross through your airspace. And then finally, the, uh, the last row there is altitude, and that just tells you how high the plane is in thousands of feet. The clock in the upper left is actually how much time you have left to play in this scenario, if you will. So, right, you can see here that I've got around three or four minutes to play. Um, after that, you kind of get graded, and then you'll either move on or it'll tell you that you're a horrible air traffic controller and, and should not quit your day job. One thing to note is when you see the altitude is the star, that means that you haven't taken off yet. And so you will press the letter of the airplane to put it on the runway and get it into the air. Uh, this first level that you see here in Atlanta is actually pretty easy. It's not hard. You don't get a lot of planes on the screen at once. Um, you'll notice to the right, new planes will light up and appear as they're queued up or getting ready to become an active flight, either by showing up on your radar screen here or by being loaded and ready to take off if that's what you're doing. Starts off pretty calm, and then it gets a little bit hectic. So what I'm going to do is, is let you hear some of the voice that is talked about on the box so you can get an idea of how it's using the SID chip and how that voice kind of adds to the game. Delta 502, turn right to 315, climb to 4,000 feet. Roger. American 803, head 180, descend to 4,000 feet. Roger. Delta 404, turn left to 225. Climb to 4,000 feet. Roger. Delta 600. Head 270 cleared for landing. Roger. So hopefully there you can see that the sound really does add a little bit of realism to the game and does sort of make you feel like you're an air traffic controller. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to move up to the next hardest difficulty level. We're going to switch airports and show you what it looks like when a little bit more is going on. So what I've done here is went ahead and kicked it up to level 5 and I went to what I think is the hardest airport map to play and that's the New York area with JFK and LaGuardia on the screen as you can see here. You start out with seven planes uh, either in flight or ready to take off and it just gets crazier from there. So I'm going to play this at a little bit faster speed so you can start to get an idea of all what's going on. The, um, the action gets intense uh, to be honest. Trying to keep track of the different types of planes and what are the, what they're doing and where they're going gets to be a little nerve-wracking. The uh, the slower types of planes, well, um, I guess you could think of them as private planes like Cessnas and whatnot. They go much slower, and then there's uh, planes that come in from Paris, which are the Concorde, and those go about twice as fast as the regular jets that you're playing with. So when you start getting into that and you get different types of aircraft, it really does start to throw off your momentum. So when you're you know, racking and stacking planes in order to, to queue them up for landing, and then you've got some that are coming at different speeds. It really does add a lot to the game, and it makes it a little crazy. So, as you can see here, it gets a little crazy. I'm going to jump into a different airport. This is Denver. 
So to the west of the Denver airport, you'll see the Rocky Mountains. You have to be at least 4,000 feet to get over those guys, which is not easy to do, especially when you're trying to come in and land and navigate your planes. Having that restriction is a little, is a little tough. The other thing that comes into this sometimes is weather. And if you've ever been to the Rocky Mountains, you know the weather can change on a dime, and, and that's exactly what happens in this game. And then finally here, this is uh, Washington, D.C. You've got uh, restricted airspace over the uh, White House Capitol Building area there and the Washington Monument. Uh, adds just another dimension of difficulty because now it's a, an airspace you can't use at all. So a lot going on with uh, a lot of the things that you're seeing here. And, and it really does get to be pretty fun, uh, at least if you like this type of game. Okay, now it's time to give Kennedy Approach a Commodore Room score. For box and contents, the box looks pretty nice. I like the graphics on the front. The manual is decent. Probably could be a little bit cooler. Uh, but overall, I thought it was fairly well executed for what it is. And I'm going to give it a 6. When it comes to graphics, um, to be honest, I really don't have any idea how realistic this is. I've never been an air traffic controller or been in a uh, room where they do that type of work. But I think they could have done more with it, and I'm going to give it a 4. Sound is, is very well done. The speech adds a lot of gameplay, in my opinion. Um, however, there is really not much else. There's, there's really no other sound effects. There's no music of any kind, and I'm sure that is because there wasn't room to do that in memory without hitting disk constantly. But that being said, um, what is there is not bad, and I'm going to give it a 7. When it comes to gameplay, there are a few dead spots in the game where you find yourself hitting the space bar to increase the time increment uh, to make things go a little bit quicker. Uh, and there are situations where planes crash for absolutely no reason, and that's counted against you. And the fact that you can't really save your game, and there are probably other scenarios that an air traffic controller encounters that aren't represented in the game. So I'm going to give the gameplay a 6. And finally with replayability. Uh, the game is fun and I do find myself coming back and to play it again and again and again. But because I'm not really continuing anything and I'm starting over from scratch in some cases, uh, I find the replayability is lacking just a little bit. But I want to go ahead and give it a 6 because it is it is very engaging when you are playing it. If you add all of those numbers up, you'll get a Commodore Room score of 29. I hope you had fun hanging out with us today, and I hope you'll come hang out in the Commodore room again real soon.